What's up, Knight fans? Sons of UCF is proudly presented by the law firm of Gordon and Partners. Since 1993, Gordon and Partners have been dedicated to the pursuit of justice for those who have been wrongfully injured at no fault of their own. It's important that you get legal advice from somebody you trust, so contact UCF alum Michael Hoffman directly if you have any legal needs or questions. Visit their website, fortheinjured.com, or text 407-913-5350 to talk to Michael directly. Don't just trust anybody. Trust the best and trust the night. Gordon and Partners for the injured. This is the Sons of UCF, the number one place for UCF sports with your distinguished host, Adam. Let's all get together and see who can solve the wordle the fastest. And Mike. You know, last year, I think I said about 30 people in the UCF, Sons of UCF group. Let's try to double that. Let's try to get 50. Now, here are the guys. All right, we are the Sons of UCF. This is episode number 190. We're brought to you by our good friends at Gordon and Partners. My name is Adam, and as always, Mr. UCF Mike is back for another week. Mike, welcome back, my friend. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good, considering the time it is on Sunday afternoon recording here so uh, this is the first time ever i think we're doing this so normally we record at night after a long day of work today is just uh like a hangover show i guess yeah usually you get tired uh mike and adam you actually get hung over actually i'm, I'm okay i don't know if mike's <laughs> mike's hung over but uh you may be getting hung over mike and adam for this week but a couple things one your boys traveling this week so my schedule's all jacked up. But two, um, this is Sunday, as Mike said. Monday starts spring, uh, spring, fall camp. So it's the the official launch of football season for us, which is freaking fantastic. So we figured we'd at least do an early show because there was so much uh, breaking news that'll go on probably throughout the week. We'll get we'll get something out in advance. We'll get this out to you. If you're listening to this, it's probably Monday morning, Mike. So uh, a dual a dual purpose for having a Sunday recording. But uh, you sound fantastic, by the way. Thank you. And I apologize that we lied to the fans. We said the next time that we were going to yeah. record one of these practice would have already started. Well, well, we changed things up a little bit yeah, on you. So yeah. but next week for sure. Well, to be fair, ready. they are meeting, I believe, on Sunday. I think it's the opening kickoff, the opening meeting uh, for UCF football. So there's something going on. And I saw some videos of it was Colton Boomer kicking. So maybe there's some football being played. We're, we're, we, we lie about a bunch. I don't think we lied about this, although we probably did. Yeah. I did see the Colton Boomer kick. Uh, do we want to break it down? Because I don't know if that was that kick good. No, it was not. It, it went up into the catwalk. <laughs> I yeah, don't know I if that was that. the intention. He had that from like the wide hash on the ten, all the way on the left hand side. I'm not sure what that was supposed to be. It was too high. Too, too hard. Too high. Who gives a shit? It's gone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, let's do real quick news off the top. If you're listening to this on Monday, a quick little announcement. I think it'll show up on Monday in your uh, in your Twitter feeds. Uh, but pleased to share with everybody that we here at the Suns of UCF, we are going to uh, we're going to join forces with something called the Ten Twelve Network. It is a network of shows uh, dedicated to the Big Twelve. They've got one show uh, for each school. At least the goal is to have one show for each school. Uh, and so they reached out, and we had some co- communications, and uh, you know they do a bunch of shows for all the schools. And so in advance of us heading to the Big Twelve, Mike, myself, Trace, we're gonna we're gonna join forces with those fellows over there, uh, and uh, and and form a little pod family. I think the one thing Mike and I have always wanted to do is have some uh, somebody to talk some trash to, have someone to have some fun with. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna join forces with the Ten Twelve Network, Mike. Uh, we were on with them last week. I think they're dropping that episode sometime this week as well, but uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we're, we're actually flattered. I mean, we're not even in the Big 12 yet, and they reached out and said, hey, we want to have you guys on board. So it uh, could be a, a good, cool, fun partnership, Mike, something I know we're both looking forward to. I think we can have a good time with this. I think we've given you a little taste of it the last couple of weeks, right? The guy from Baylor that was on the live show on Thursday, I believe he's part of the network too, right? And then the yeah. Iowa State, the Iowa State girl from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So – yeah, it's good to have these guys. When when we have a big game against these schools, we'll be able to get on there with them, talk some trash, and maybe do a little simulcast thing and uh, have a little fun with it. A little different yeah. than what we've been doing. Yeah, they've got some cool stuff, too, that they're a part of that we can bring to you all, a couple of sponsorship opportunities. So uh, stay tuned for all that. But uh, you'll see that on Monday. Excited to be on board with uh, the good folks at 1012. Uh, and as we 
Uh, I think we've done a nice job, at least the UCF has, integrating ourselves into the Big 12. We got some Twitter fights already. The Baylor guy was uh, would tweeted like, man, I didn't know UCF fans went like that. UCF actually took that tweet and made their own tweet about that, right? So I think we've already uh, we've, we've announced our entrance with authority. I think the Big 12 knows we're, uh, we're coming, Mike. Yeah, they're going to know about us for sure when it comes to social media. Th- there's no mistake in who we are. Uh, and they're going to know about us on the field soon enough, too. So uh, I'm looking forward to joining the Big 12. We still have one more year here. We got to take there's some business to take care of still. Uh, I want that last conference championship. But next year, we're at this time, we're a Big 12 all the way and pretty exciting times for us at UCF. Well, the most exciting things going on, Mike, is your favorite subject, your favorite topic. Cranky Mike comes out in full force on a few different items. But Cranky Mike usually comes out on recruiting, and UCF has been on quite a hot streak these last couple of days, Mike. It started with a, with a five-star kicker, uh, Grant Reddick, that uh, committed to UCF, uh, rated the number one kicker in the nation by the, the Coles Kicking website. Then John Walker, a top 100 player, four-star recruit, chooses UCF over the likes of Ohio State, Michigan, uh, Miami, Florida, and then uh, on Saturday, in an okey doke move that was, I think, foresaw by a lot of folks, Braden Marshall uh, picks UCF, a four-star kit out of Lake Mary, uh, defensive back Mike. So UCF's been on a bit of a recruiting boon of late. Um, look, the reality is we 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 don't we, we still have a lot of ways to go for these guys sign. We get all that. We don't know what kind of players are going to be when they get here. We get all that. But just the concept of Gus finding ways to get these kids to come to UCF. I mean, these are recruits that we typically have not in our past had a lot of success pulling and keeping at UCF, Mike. And Gus has gotten like three in the last seven days. And the rumors are out there. There's there's more to come. So let's go big picture really quickly. Taking away for a second whether these kids are good or not, whether they're going to stick around or not. How big a deal is this to you that UCF is is getting their hat pulled by some of the, some of the best kids in, in all of, of high school football, particularly all the best kids here in Orlando? Well, it is a big deal. I, I know there's people like me that say I don't care, and honestly, I, I don't. But it, history has shown that the classes at the top, Alabama at the top every year, Ohio State, those are the classes that go on to have the best seasons. They have the best chance of winning the more of these guys you sign. Now, if you, have, if you sign one guy and he's a four-star and he turns out to be not that good, then obviously it doesn't make a difference. But if you're signing all four-star guys and all five, four or five-star guys, then your, your chances increase greatly. So the more he's doing this, the better it is. That three in the last week is great. If we can get a few more here, that would be fantastic. It's great. I, I know I, I paint myself as the uh, negative guy. I'm not negative uh, about the, the players themselves. It's great that they want to come here. Just the, the whole process and everything is kind of old to me now. But it's still not guaranteed that they're coming. So I just don't like to spike the football until I'm actually in the end zone. It's kind of my thing. Yeah. So. Once these kids are on campus, I'll be more excited about them. But right now, it's kind of hard just the way the whole situation is set up. Yeah, and, that, and that's fair. And I think I said the same thing this morning on, on Twitter. I got involved in some sort of a Twitter conversation. And I don't think it's a lack of us being pessimistic or a, a, a sense of us being pessimistic. It's the construct by which recruiting is that, that causes some folks to go, okay, this, to your point, this thing isn't done yet. There, there isn't ink to paper just yet. So while there are all indications that these, these, these kids seem to be very committed to UCF, and they're saying they're not going on visits. And I and I believe that. I trust that. I hope that that's accurate. And I hope that, you know, they're all early enrollees from what they're saying so far, which is even better. It's even better news. That means they'll, they'll be on campus in, in, in January. So, I mean, they, they don't have a lot of time to, you know, flip their commit if they really want to. But the construct of the system also allows for transfer. It also allows for NIL and yada, yada, yada. I'm like, but the bigger picture. Gus Malzahn came in here and said, listen, I'm going to recruit like my hair is on fire. I'm going to get the top kids in the nation. We all were like, okay, cool. Every coach says that. And he's had some success here and there, right? We pulled some guys. We've been very, very good in the transfer portal. But we hadn't really kind of crossed that threshold from, um, you know, from a high school standpoint. And I saw Derek Hallman on Twitter basically say, if, if this class pans out, this is like that first recruiting class for the University of Miami in the 80s. This could be the legendary class that starts it all, Mike. And that's pretty freaking exciting to think about if, if that is true because what we've always talked about, it only takes a couple of kids to commit and the rest of them go, oh, wait a minute, let me do that too. I mean, so in, in some respects, maybe this becomes the class that launches you know, UCF into a, you know, an other world trajectory from that standpoint. I hope so. And, and that is going to depend a lot on Gus staying here in Orlando too, right? Because now with these new transfer rules, are these kids committing to UCF or are they committing to the coach? Which uh, the last two coaches have been out of here in two years. It, 
I, I'm the, I, the last thing I want to see is Gus leave. I want him to stay here for the next 20 years. I want him to retire here. But if he does leave, are all these kids going with him? It's another reason why I just don't get so excited about th- this whole process. Uh, it's the same thing with the NFL draft. That's the other part of it. Uh, that's why I don't care about the NFL draft because you got all these guys putting in all these hours, evaluating all these players, and they get drafted in the first top 10 picks. How many times are they a bust? So these kids, they can be rated high, and they can turn out to be a bust. It's the the combination of all those things is why I don't get so excited about recruiting. But in the big scheme of things, if Gus is bringing in 10 four-star players in this class, and this is the class that helps turn the whole thing around, I'll be the first one to say, man, three years from now, that, that class was incredible. You know, Look what they've done since they've been here. Look how many conference championships we've won. Look at all the stuff they've done. So I'll be happy then to go back and say, what a great job Gus has done. Well, it's not even Gus. It's also position coaches for John Walker specifically. Uh, you know, he even said in a lot of the coverage that, uh, of his announcement that his uh, relationship with Kenny Martin, the D, the D line coach at UCF, was huge, and that he wasn't necessarily thinking UCF right away, and that Coach Martin came in and, and formed that relationship with him, formed that bond with him, and then he was kind of like, "Man, I love that dude. I want to go play for him." Well, if Kenny Martin goes and gets a D coordinator job next year at you know whatever state university. You know, at that point, then I'll be like, oh, wait a minute. Is he going to is he going to take this kid with him, too? So all, all that stuff obviously continues to be an issue. And that's what sucks about it is you want to celebrate the moment, but you also can can recognize the impending doom. I think there's a there's a very clear line in the sand between the old jaded. We've been burned before fan and sort of the new fan who's who's had nothing but success. And that's no disrespect to either side. But you can clearly see the kind of the line in the sand between the folks who've been like, all right, we've been here before. Everybody calm down. Let's just see what happens. And then the folks who are like, yeah, we're going to the moon. No one's going to stop us yet. I think you can clearly see that line between the fan base. And the other thing with this whole recruiting thing that hasn't happened yet, but it's not going to surprise anybody if it does, these four-star kids, now that they're committed to UCF, they drop down to three stars. And, <laughs> sure, and that, sure. and that sure. kind of ruins our whole recruiting ranking anyway. And so the, the, the whole thing is over the years, has worn on me to the point where I am now. And, and and I think a lot of people that are excited about the recruiting right now are, like you're saying, the younger kids that really haven't been watching this for the last 20 years. And, and they're kind of new to it, so they're very excited when we sign a four-star guy. It is a big deal at the time, but uh, over the, the long haul, it may prove not to be really that big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, we'll, to your point, we never know until these kids are in pads and are on the field and, and, and playing in the game what that's going to turn into. I think the other thing, though, I feel better about, and you think about previous staffs and, and you know, I don't know, maybe this is, I, I don't mean this to be a hot take, but, you know, uh, getting a kid on campus is one thing, right? Obviously, that means the kid has talent. If you're in a four-star rating territory, somebody has looked at that person and said, hey, man, this kid's got a lot of talent. This kid's a player for us. Um, so, so that's one thing, right? But then they get on campus, and how do they perform? Some of that's on the kid, but some of that's on the coaches too, right? A lot of it's how coaches develop players, the scheme, the fit, how they're used. I feel pretty good about this coaching staff, Mike, that even as we get these kids on campus, that the coaching staff is going to essentially be responsible for developing them and the good players. I feel like we've got a really good group of coaches. Not that we've had bad ones in the past, and maybe that sounds like you know I'm throwing shade at the you know Eric Shenander years, but I feel like we've got some really good coaches that if we've got kids with this kind of talent that we can make players out of them. There's always going to be one that we all are you know four years from now are going to scratch our heads and be like, man, whatever happened to that kid? Like he was so good, just didn't materialize. There's always going to be that one or two, or those one or two kids, right? But I feel like e- even if these kids are you know. Um, yeah, you know, marginal talents coming in, I think, and they're not, by the way, but if they were, I think our coaching staff has the ability to develop these kids into really good players. Yeah, and I think you can say the same about UCF coaching staffs for a while. Now, you go back to the O'Leary staff. I mean, he was bringing in a bunch of two stars and yep. look at all the stuff he yep. got out of those kids. Yep. I, I think these guys are, are just as good and, and can bring the most out of these players. But uh, it, it, the thing I do like about this class so far and what they have done this last week is – they stay true to their word. These are local kids, and these kids are right around Orlando. They're, they want to stay home. They've convinced them of that for now, and uh, hopefully you know, it's, it's the beginning of something here. This, that's how Miami did it. They, they shut down Miami in, in the early 80s. Nobody else could go in there and recruit. And now for the last few years here, not just us, but all the Florida schools have been hurt by all these out-of-state schools, Alabama and Texas A&M and Ohio State. They've been coming in here and stealing all the best Florida players for a while now. So to be able to keep the Orlando kid in Orlando, I think, is, is the 
biggest deal of this whole thing. Well, yeah, there's there's two. There's a double sided effect there. One, w- you know, we're also getting better, but we're preventing Miami or Florida, or Florida State, from getting this player too, and also getting better, right? So you see the net gain on our side. But two, I think it's it's a hopefully this is a snowball effect, right? Another kid or two in this class says, "Hey, you know what, man? Like they're putting together a good good talent. Like I'm gonna go there too. Like, hey, I know that guy. Like I play with him. He's he's I want to go play there. He's he's cool, right? Then there's the kids in the 24 class who are like, man, UCF is putting a bunch of stuff together. They're in the Big 12 now, uh, and that's the other under uh, underlying thing here. I'm like, um, you know, we heard we heard Braden Marshall say it, man. Being in the Big 12 is an, is a big deal. I don't maybe we didn't recognize how big a deal that really was, right? I mean, part of me wonders, are these kids still coming here if we're in the American Conference? What do you think? Probably not. Yeah, I agree. Probably not. And it's because they've, along with the rest of the country, have been brainwashed to believe that it's either P5 or you're playing in the minor leagues, basically. And as we've known, coming up in the American now for like the last 10 years, that's not really true. The top of the American can compete with any of these other conferences. Uh, and plenty of Power 5 schools suck for a long time. This whole time, Kansas has been garbage. Vanderbilt's been terrible. Yet they, they have that label. And it is a big deal now that we're in the Big 12. We can kind of shed that, even though now that we're finally getting into the Big 12, is it going to become a Big 2? And we're going to have to fight through that again. Right. But I, I think people are seeing that, you know, UCF is more than just being in the conference. It's the whole package of the school. Where the school's headed, yeah. uh, the, the size of the school, everything around it, the campus itself, th- that has to play a big part in this thing to it for the recruits. Well, it took away the one thing, right, that the other, te- other school could say. They could say, well, hey, you know what? Yeah, you can stay local and – yeah, they got a good on-campus experience. The academics are great and everything and blah, blah, blah. But can you play for a championship there? Can you win a title there? No, nah, because they're they're in that group of five. Like, do you want to play in the American or do you want to play in the in the in the Pac twelve or the you know the ACC, right? That they took we took that one thing away from them now. And I think you're seeing what's scary is if if you can level the playing field like this. Now to your point, we'll see what happens with the SEC and, and the Big Ten or whatever, right? But if you can level the playing field, and now it's just basically mono e mono, old school, like our, our our school versus your school. You know, I think UCF's coming in with a, with a puncher's chance because there's also rumors that there are NIL deals that these kids were offered that they turned down or didn't want. And that'll be the other thing that's kind of un, uneven at some point, potentially. But it's it, it's it could be scary if we can keep these kids home and keep this momentum and everything's a level playing field. Like the, Gus has the ability. I think Derek Hallman's tweet about this being like that first Miami class. I mean, I think there's some credence to that, and this could this could really take this thing off in a hurry. Again, we're gonna miss on some of these kids. I get it, right? You know, one of the one or two of these kids may not pan out to be what we think, and you know, d- doesn't play as much, isn't as good as we think. Blah 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 blah. But I think the the idea that UCF is now on the map and they're they're going toe to toe and they're winning these battles um, at some point it's gonna pay dividends, Mike. And it, hopefully it's it's sooner than later, but at some point it's gonna pay dividends. Yeah, and you know, if all things are equal, you know. We do have an advantage being that we are in Orlando, which is a very cool city when you want to compare it to Gainesville, Florida, Tallahassee, Florida. I mean, Miami's cool. That would be a tough one. I think uh, it would be a tough decision. You can convince a lot of kids to go have fun down in South Beach. Hmm. But if you're comparing us to Gainesville, you're comparing us to other schools in the Big 12, you want to play in Orlando, you want to play in Ames, Iowa. You want to play in Lubbock, Texas. We have a big advantage over those schools now that we're in the Big 12. Yeah. I don't really see – the only thing now is maybe you got the SEC still that has that prestige over us, and they're going to be getting a lot more money, so that may grow. But other than that, they, we're right on par now with everybody. Miami and Florida State, we were, they have no really big advantage over us anymore. No, not at all. Yeah, if you're, if you're 18, 19 years old right now and you're making a college choice, um, you've, you've known no parts of Miami being a dynasty. Because that happened before you were born. Now, you can look back at the history book and say, oh, my goodness, wow, they were great in the 90s. But you, you don't remember any of that stuff. That happened before you were born, right? You can maybe look back and be like, hey, when I was five, Tim Tebow was leading the Gators to some stuff, and that's pretty cool. Um, but to your point, that, that history stuff is hard to get wiped out. I don't know how much these kids today care about, like, that old historical, like, oh, this is the great place and yada, 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 yada. I think you've got a, a group of kids who are also excited about being part of that of that sort of journey and, and seeing some of these guys that that come back to UCF and talk about these things. Um, and and that, if your point, if that's neutralized, 
then then you, you, UCF's got a great advantage, you know, where they sit uh, geographically, you know, their competition, who they're playing against. And I think it also helps not only the local kids, right? But if, if you know, we're, we're playing, you know, Baylor on a random Saturday next year and we're housing them, right? And you're, you're a kid in Texas and you're like, man, I got a Baylor offer. But, man, this UCF looks pretty good too, right? Like, do we start now, you know, making those national inroads? Um, and, and that's where things can get scary. And that's where the excitement comes in because the bigger picture excitement is like, holy crap, this could really take off. Yeah, and the one thing that does concern us that we've talked about so many times is the money. We can't afford to bring some of these recruits, which is the nice part about this last week is these kids have decided to come to UCF, and unless there's some bag men that we don't really know about, mm. I don't think they're getting paid much to come here. They're not getting paid millions of dollars like the quarterback to be a quarterback at Alabama or what was what, what the receiver that went from, what, Syracuse or Pitt, from Pitt to, to USA. somewhere yeah. else? Yeah. And reported outrageous amounts of money. I don't think we're able to do that. So um, that's the only part that still scares me about the recruits that committed this week. <laughs> and I wish they could sign today and, and kind of ease my fears a little bit because yeah. I'm still scared that up until that day, somebody's going to show up at their house with a big bag of money, and, and that changes everything. Everybody has a price, let's be honest. I, I really like to go to UCF too, but if you tell me I can go to UCF and, and have a good career or I could go to Ohio State, and have a nice career, but at Ohio State, they're going to pay me $5 million. I'm 18 years old. <laughs> yeah. I'm taking the $5 million. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of these kids might have that uh, that situation presented to them. Yeah, either way, net net of it, this is, this is a fantastic trajectory for UCF. Certainly – you know, forgive some of us who are a little bit tempered in their in their excitement right now because there are, there are still a lot of procedural hurdles that have to be crossed, and that's of no fault of UCF. That's of no fault of these these kids who are committing. That's just the way the system works and the way your system's allowed to work. Uh, so, for for some folks who are kind of tempering their expectations, I mean, I think that's that's probably part of the reason why. But make no mistake about it, th- this is certainly a, a huge watershed moment in in UCF history, and if this continues. Um, yeah, I mean, Derek Hallman may, may true, uh, may prove to be, uh, prophetic, uh, in, uh, uh, in his thinking, Mike, but if these kids make it to UCF, uh, which I, we hope they all do in 2023, we know one of their new opponents, Mike, a, a new, a new opponent was announced this week in the, now the 2023 football schedule is complete. Mike, uh, we are going to be welcoming the Villanova Wildcats to FBC mortgage stadium sometime in 2023, early September. So the non-conference schedule is complete for 2023. Kent Golden State Fla- or the Kent State Golden Flashes, excuse me, the Boise Broncos and Villanova. Mike, you're out of conference 2023 schedule. Obviously, with nine uh, uh, Big 12 games, four of which are at home, five of which will be on the road. Mike, uh, two of these three games, Kent State and Villanova, at home for UCF. So, what do you make of the 2023 schedule? Finally, having that thing filled in. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not going to spark. Uh, 20,000 people to jump off their couch and buy season tickets because Villanova's on the schedule <laughs> or, or Kent State. Uh, people are not going to get excited about it, but uh, it, it's what we, we had to do. We had to fill the schedule. There's not many options right now, so we'll take it. And actually, it may be something that we need in that year because we're going to go yes. play five on conference games on the road that year, only four at home. You may, on those years, you may have to have a, a lighter at a conference schedule, especially for the first year. Uh, I think it's okay. And then once now that we've established ourselves in the Big 12, it may be easier to schedule some out-of-conference games. Uh, we're going to be playing nine conference games instead of eight. So that, that's one less out-of-conference we have to schedule every year. Uh, I'm not going to be concerned about it going forward. Yeah. These games are fine. Kent State, it, it's an old rivalry going back to the Mac days. I don't even remember playing. I mean, we, might, we had to have played them once or twice, right? I'm going to check it out now. Um, Villanova, I know we played once. I believe it was 2006 or 2008, one of those opening games yep. where we won – uh, you know, comfortably but ugly. Uh, let's see. Kent State, we're two and two all time against Kent. Oh, rubber match! Here we go. So, yeah, they got rubber, the rubber match, match here. Um, they, oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong one here. But it was two and two. Right now, I'm gonna lost my place. Ah, Kent State, two and two. Kent State, Mac days, Mac opponent. Um, they won the last two. They've won the last two meetings. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> Man, we, we better put something here. up on the bulletin board uh, all the way leading up to the opening game next year. We want yeah, revenge. The last guys. time we met was in that 2004 season where we did not win a game. So, yeah. uh, some revenge. Here revenge we go. Is, is on the plate for next season. Yeah, ultimately, look, I'm I'm perfectly fine with the schedule. I think you know the Big 12 scheduling model, though, I think is to have one 
you know, out of conference power five opponent. I think we get kind of grandfathered in with Boise State sort of being in that in that echelon. And I, I think obviously, you know, the, the the Big Twelve recognizes the how quickly these uh, you know these games get kind of snatched up. There's not a lot of opportunity for UCF probably to, to make a change there. So to your point, I, I'm fine with it, with this game. Right at Boise is going to be a challenge, right? That's not going to be a, a pushover game. Um, you know, Boise at home is always great. Uh, we'll see where they are at that point. But Kent State and Villanova, obviously, to your point, those would hopefully would be winnable games. Um, you know, at that point in time. So I'm perfectly fine with this as a as a year one Big Twelve schedule. Um, I get to your point. You don't have the sexy name on here, right? You don't have. You know, if you think about our our, our future slates too, 2024. Obviously, we have uh, we have the game with Florida on the calendar. We have New Hampshire, and we have uh, Sam Houston State in 2024. 2025, we're looking at at Maryland, FU, and home for uh, for North Carolina, right? So so that the schedule gets uh, gets much tougher. Um, 26 and 27 aren't aren't flushed out yet, so there's some future games to be scheduled there. So I'm perfectly fine with this being you know, year one, big 12, especially if you're going to have five road games. I get the sexy name isn't on here, Mike, but I think these are, this is a nice, uh, a nice way to sort of start that, uh, that, that off. I did posit this on, on Twitter like a couple weeks ago. I never, I never got your feedback on this. There was a, a columnist, I think in Oklahoma, who was talking about as if the big 12 wants to make a splash as they open up splash, as they open up the, the new sort of conference, maybe they should schedule the first game of the year to be sort of a, a conference game at the home stadium of the new school, meaning somebody would come to UCF and kick off the year with a conference game. I don't know if that's something that even consider doing. Everything's got to change at that point, Mike, but would you be in favor of that? Would you be in favor of first ever game of the 2023 season being an, a home game versus a conference opponent? Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Um, we saw how it worked out in 2007 when you open up the stadium it wasn't the first game of the season yeah but the first home game against texas uh, that was a tough start to the season we were at nc state that year and then we had texas the next week at home uh, that, that's fine we're, and we've been talking for years about having one of these kickoff classic games you know a lot of big schools start off the season with a big matchup right away and when you're in a power five conference you know a, a loss early doesn't hurt you as bad so if we were to open the season against oklahoma to start the year and even if we lost a tough one, you know, I think we'd still get some, some credit for it at least. So I, I'd be down with that. I think that'd be fun. And Oklahoma would be my choice. Like, obviously, with the whole connection with Dylan Gabriel, if he's still yeah. there that last year, yeah. uh, the, the bounce house would be Oof. electric. Oh, my gosh. Day. And tickets for that game would be outrageous. I can't even imagine what the prices would be to get into that game. That would be probably – I mean, does that beat the college game day atmosphere? I mean, just to, off the top of my head – all the factors you laid out, Dylan Gabriel coming back, you know, opening of the sort of the, the new Big 12 uh, home, our first ever conference home game. I imagine, you know, it'll be, you know, somewhat of a, a hopefully a prime time or a, a, a big TV uh, style game. Like Jeff Lebby, offensive coordinator. I mean, all the storylines there Would that. Would, could that be the top game ever of UCF if that actually gets scheduled? Yeah, at, at home, probably, yes. In our home stadium, I think it would be. Um, <laughs> it would be awesome. That, that, that would be a, a for sure, I think, game day game. And, and even if we were to be an underdog in that game, having it be that early in the year, I think, helps. I, I, you know, they haven't had the chance to play a cupcake either and, and get things worked out. So as both teams come in and we would be at home, I think that'd be a little advantage for us actually going into a game even against a school like Oklahoma, if they were deemed to be better that year. Well, it, even I mean, Brett Yormark would be strutting around like a peacock, right? If one of his new teams beat the exist the the, out, the team leaving, I guess at that point. Uh, I mean, imagine the Big Twelve trash talk you'd get when it's like, hey, the you know Oklahoma, you know, all right, but get out! You can't even beat a, you can't even play, you know compete in our conference. Get good luck in the in the SEC. I think the Big Twelve, you know, Yormark would be walking around without a shirt on half the time. Yeah, they'd be out with the old and with the new. I'd love it if we could beat Oklahoma coming in and. You know, Houston could play Texas that first week yep. at home and beat them. That, that'd be the, the best case scenario. Heck, I'd even root for Cincinnati if it was against one of those two schools. So Cincinnati uh, and West Virginia, I guess, could could square off. They're relatively close. I don't know what you do yeah. with BYU. Maybe you throw them a, a Baylor or Texas Tech or something. There's really nobody super close. But yeah, that, that would be really cool. I think that would be interesting. I I normally wouldn't want to start with a conference game just because, to your point, you want to kind of ease into your schedule. You know, you want to play a Kent State first and get everything right, but. Um, but I think under those circumstances, you, you could absolutely talk me into that that idea you just you just posited. Right. And at that point for us, I think it'd be fine. It'd be year three of Gus's system. He would have his guys here. If you're talking Plumlee has a good season this year and he comes back for another year, 
or even if you know by then Castellanos is ready or Mikey Keene's back at quarterback, I think we're set up not just this year, but in 23 to be have a good football team and, and have everybody buying into what Gus has been selling here. I think we'd be ready to go for that opening game in the bounce house against either one, Texas or Oklahoma. But give me Oklahoma because we haven't had that and we have all the other stuff that we have there with them. Give me Oklahoma, Mike says. Yeah, I, look, that would be that would be fantastic. Either way, a lot of good, um, a lot of good positive uh, future facing news. Mike Christy Malzahn out with a podcast. Gee, by the way, welcome to the podcast space, Christy. Yeah, she's joined the rest of the world and started her own show, just like everybody else. <laughs> everybody, probably half of you listening to this show probably have your own podcast. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, that's cool. I mean, did you see the, uh, the pre- did you see the preview video that they put out where she was basically like? You know, giving Gus a bunch of crap because he only scored 20 points in a game. <laughs> yeah, I did. But 20 points in the national championship game. <laughs> uh, that was cool. So I wonder if she's going to be doing video like that all the time or if that was just kind of to, to tease it with Gus there um, or if she's just going to do a standard audio podcast. Uh, it'll be cool. I, I enjoy seeing people come up with different ideas and different way, different stories behind, you know, UCF and stuff like we, we cover a lot of it. We cover the games. We cover all this other stuff recruiting, but it's cool to see behind the scenes, different perspectives. You know, you got Austin Camden with the walk on perspective and now you got the coach's wife perspective. Yeah. The dudes on the mall got the student perspective. <laughs> Everybody's got their own way of looking at things. And I, I think that's good. I think the more, the better. And, and it keeps the UCF fans engaged. I, I've never been one that say, Oh man, they're doing this on their podcast. But who cares? I think, it helps. I think if people listen to a different podcast, they listen to the Pegasus podcast or they listen to the black and gold banneret and they, and they like it and they say, well, what else is out there? Maybe they, they heard about those guys first and then they find us that way. I, I think it only helps all podcasts help each other. So somebody may listen to Chrissy Malzahn podcast for the first time and then say, well, what other uh, UCF podcasts are out there? You know, maybe that, they'd never listened to any podcast before. And then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're listening to us now. So I think all of it is good. The more, the better. I love a good dudes of the mall reference. You can you can usually get a dudes in the mall reference every episode from Mike at some point. Um, but to your point, we have one. Brandon and Justin, those are my boys. There you go. We have one. You have to know. Wow, I didn't know they had names. Um, <laughs> we have one year left in the American Conference, so obviously we don't want to overlook too much, right? We're talking recruiting. We're talking you know, twenty twenty three schedule. Obviously, we have the twenty twenty two year as we wrap up the American Mike and the preseason poll came out. Uh, Houston won seven first place votes. Cincinnati two ten per, uh, first place votes. UCF three seven first place votes did the media get that right mike is ucf being third in that preseason poll which again i know means nothing at this point right but is ucf being third appropriate oh uh, well a lot of this is based off last season that's basically how these preseason polls work which is part of the stupidity of them because as we know this is not like nfl where you know you got the same team coming back every year you're turning over 25 percent of your roster yet people are basing their predictions on this season on what they saw last year. So it's kind of stupid. And I'm still not over the fact that Trace Chalko had a vote in this thing. <laughs> uh-huh. and somehow we didn't. I don't know how he got that vote and, and didn't share it with us. At least get ask us for our opinion on it. Yeah. Um, I will say but, on, on Trace's fine. behalf, uh, I will say really quickly, Trace's behalf, he um, he had that vote prior to joining us uh, around here. Two, uh, he, he messaged me the next day and was very apologetic about not even realizing he probably could have looped his in on that. So certainly an oversight <laughs> on his part. I think he was like, oh, crap, I didn't even, I even consider it. Um, but I do think he voted the way you would have voted anyway. I think we worked this out on the show last week. I think he would have voted in the same way that you and I probably would have uh, would have also voted. Yeah, probably. If I was being honest and put in, in uh, a real vote of how I think it's going to go, but that's Mike some days. It depends on which mood you catch me in. Sometimes that's I might right. just be in that's the mood true. of chaos, and I would true. send in a vote that said UCF 1, Temple 2, Tulane 3. I would flip it all upside down just to – Very true. Because that way it, it changes the points, right? Because this whole thing is based on points, overall points. That's, that's what – we finished third overall with points. But if I had voted – Cincinnati last, they would have only got one point from me. Maybe we, we would have bumped us up that way. So uh, whatever, it's a preseason poll. All those preseason polls are what they are. They're just like the watch list, you know, just like all these other things, just to get people talking about college football again, but really in the big picture, don't mean anything. Yeah, I just thought with Houston, I don't know. I mean, they edged out Cincinnati total points. I think it was 242 to 241 or something like that. Um, and obviously Cincy had more first place votes with Houston. 
I, I think we're just voting that they, they have an easy schedule, right? I think that's the vote for Houston to win is maybe, I mean, not that they don't have talent, not that they're not returning a lot of good, uh, good players from last year, but I think it's more a vote for their schedule, right? Versus maybe their talent. That's going to have a big part to do with it. I would think last year they did, you know, I believe they went undefeated in conference up to the championship game, right? But they also didn't play us and they didn't play Cincinnati last year either. Yep. I think they had a close one with SMU. Uh, I still haven't looked up whether that game is going to be. I think that game's in Houston this year, I want to say. Um, but, yeah, that, that's going to have a big part to do with it. They, they still have a lot to prove to me, but they're not a bad team. I'm not saying no, it, for like, sure. Houston's. Yeah. They're going to be in the top three or four of this conference, I believe it. And if I see them on Championship Saturday, I would not be surprised. But, yeah, I think the schedule has to have something. And their at a conference schedule has been just the weakest I've ever seen, especially last year, I remember. It, it was terrible. I think they had Rice on there and a couple other cupcakes. So uh, I think they get a little more credit than they deserve. But, you know, if they keep winning, that's all they can do right now. So uh, we may get a shot at them, hopefully, on yeah. Championship Saturday. Yeah, I think those are the right three. I think UCF, Cincinnati, Houston are the right top three teams, just maybe not in the order. Uh, that that folks voted them in, but I think it also probably helps Gus a little bit with that narrative around like, look, they still don't believe in us. They still don't think we can do this. You know, they're you know look, the Cincinnati team that lost a lot of cat. They still think they're better than you. A Houston team they think they're better than. You. I think this gives Gus a little bit of that, you know, chip on the shoulder. It seems like he's been coaching with that chip on the shoulder since he's been in UCF. You know, it seems like that's been a bit of a mantra. So I think it gives him the ability to keep that that chip firmly planted on the shoulders. Yeah, and I actually, it's a good thing to have other teams ranked higher than us. So then when we do play them, yep. we get a little more credit for it. So I, I'm actually going to root for Cincinnati to beat Arkansas in the opening week. Come into the conference. Come into the Bright House. I'm sorry. Where <laughs> we I think it's the Bright House FBC. to you, buddy. FBC. <laughs> FBC, yes. House. Come into the Bright House. There. Show up someplace. Wow, that was going back. <laughs> <You> okay. <laughs> Sunday Mike uh, is a whole different Mike. Come into Orlando undefeated and then ranked in the top 15. And then when we beat you, that's even better for us. And Houston, go ahead, run the table again too. And when we play in the championship Saturday, you know, be in the top ten and, and give us that little boost that we need. That that's always good for us. So uh, I, sometimes not getting credit at the beginning of the year could be good. I, go back to the 2017 season. What were we in the preseason poll that year? I don't think anybody. I think we were probably finished, picked to finish fifth, fourth, or fifth, sixth. Going into we, that yeah, year we should have. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but we should. We were six and seven the year before. Why the hell would anybody put right. us top one or two at that point? Right. So, yeah, as I said earlier, it's all based on the year before. So, people, and what else do they have to base it on? They, they haven't seen these kids play. You can't watch them practice. All they know is what happened last year. Most people voting on these things, I'm sure, and we can ask Trace. Did he go up and down Cincinnati's roster and Houston's roster and Tulane's roster and East Carolina's roster and see how many guys are coming back? How many, how many guys have left for the NFL? Did he go over the Phil Steele magazine for each one of the teams? Or is he just kind of basing it on where they finished last year, the games that we UCF played against them last year, what he saw there? Uh, I doubt he watched all the conference games last year, right? I know I didn't. Well, I watched the UCF how, would you, how would you do it? Yeah, that's how I have to do it. Yeah. That's, that's the only way to do it. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just my thing against preseason polls right. in themselves. But right, so, uh, uh, yeah, you could be a student of the game and read every single scintilla of information about some some team, and then be like, okay, well, I've really studied that third down percentage from Cincinnati, and I feel like I, I think I know. Right, or you could, to your point, all right. Here's where they were last year. Here's what they lost. Here's their schedule. Yeah, they're bringing back this guy. Right, they still have their head coach. Yada yada. I mean, I think that's typically how people usually do the the calculus on this. I'm sure there's one or two people who dive into a couple of key stats and try to figure some of that part out. But I think it's probably what you're talking about. Like, all right, who do they play? Who do they lose? Who do they got? When do they play this person? Oh, oh wow, that's tough. Okay, here we go. Like, I, I think that's probably the way that's put together. Yeah, you look at the schedule's got to be play a big part too. Are they playing this team on the road? Uh, UCF and Cincinnati, that that one's in Orlando this year. Okay, so maybe UCF has a little of advantage, whereas it would have been opposite last year. So uh, I guess a couple of things like that for tie-breaking reasons. But everybody has their perspective or you know what they think about a certain team, their perception on the team. Like right now, everybody knows and thinks the cows suck, right? And they're not wrong for thinking that because they've <laughs> sucked for the last few years. But it's possible that they they play a lot better this year and win even five six games. I I, I don't know. I guess it's possible. Anything is possible. And in this kind, it's not like this conference is filled with, you know, a whole bunch of playoff teams. This, this conference is is what it's been. It, it's very competitive, but in the middle, anybody could beat anybody. To, if I told you right now, tomorrow Tulane was playing against East Carolina, who are you picking to win? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. 
because those teams are pretty much home, home or away. Flip them. Yeah. Who's exactly. Home, yeah. Uh, yeah. Home, uh, I don't know. So yeah. Um, I think I, I go we'll EC, see that. ECU. Yeah, because the whole Nailers, right? Because you know the name of the quarterback. Well, they have a running back, too. Uh, it's pretty good. I think Keaton Mitchell's pretty good. All right. All right. Yeah, I, actually, I think East Carolina is going to have. <laughs> See, I actually problems. do, too. I think they're actually going to be pretty good this year. I do think they're going to yeah, be improved. They, they played us tough last year. I mean, we're, we're a yeah. Mark Anthony Richards out of the body bag on the bench uh, and making a couple of key runs um uh late in the game from losing that thing <laughs> like i mean that that was that was a close one down to the end we we did they, they played us tough in orlando and we got to go there this year yeah and i mean a lot of young people may not remember this but going back to our conference usa days we had a very hard time winning yes, games in east carolina we did. and when their fans are into it if they get off to a good start to this season and they have a nice record going into that game on october 22nd and it's a night game that could be a dangerous place to play mm-hmm. you know east carolina is not I know we don't think of them that way because we've just beat the crap out of them now for, what, the last eight years or so. But that could be a dangerous game. And not just for us. That could be a dangerous atmosphere. Or Cincinnati, I'm not sure if they play them home away, but Cincinnati has to go there or Houston has to go there. So uh, a team like that could, could spoil some things. A team like Tulane, I think, could spoil some things. Or one of these other middle-of-the-road schools could always get in the mix there. So. Uh, it's going to be an interesting year. I, I, I'm excited for it, but the preseason polls, as we know, and the AP and the coaches' polls are going to be coming out soon too, yeah. and we're going to be cursing at... Is uh, is Cincinnati in either of those polls, you think? Oh, if they are, they're going to be like 20... It's somewhere between 21 and Considering 25. they lost like be... six guys to the draft and uh, on both mm-hmm. sides of the ball, I mean, I agree with you. I think they're probably in that like 22, 23 range. Uh, but it makes no sense, right? Like we lost Scott Frost, and we're like, yeah, they can't. We can't. You know, we can't rank these guys. They're they're going to lose literally a first round uh, cornerback. You know, two stud uh, D linemen, their starting quarterback, their starting running back, and they're going to be like twenty third. Yeah, <laughs> if they're in there at all. So uh, we'll see. This uh, is, I, I don't know. This is a fun stat I did not know until um, grandfather Mike Oresco read it to me off one of the thirty six pieces of paper he had in front of him. Every team in the Americans were turning their starting quarterback except Cincinnati. It was not that was not a stat I was prepared to hear that day, and I was like, oh, I I hadn't considered it that way, but I I guess that's true. I don't know who Tulane's starting quarterback. I guess it's uh, that one kid from Boca, Michael Pratt, I suppose they're, they're referring to. But every starting quarterback outside of Cincy is coming back this year in the American. Well, they're coming back, but are they still the starting quarterback? Oh. And we can ask that question of ourselves. Oh, Mikey Keene is coming back, right? On. And we don't even know if he's going to be the quarterback. So good call. Uh, it's an interesting stat. I didn't I didn't know that either. But I guess maybe that's the only school where the starting quarterback from last year graduated. It's officially gone, back. yes. Yeah, I assume it's yeah. officially gone, yeah. Which is weird in itself to only have one senior you know, quarterback last year of all the starters that are gone now. Uh, so I, I, it's another reason why this conference is going to be tough because now you got pretty much every team returning a guy with some experience at least. And I think you're going to see well, more than the usual number of upsets in, in conference play. That's got to be a loose stat, though, because Memphis played in, like, multiple quarterbacks last year. Remember, they played one against us that was starting because there was an injury. I don't, I don't – I think Temple played, like, seven quarterbacks last year. So, there's got to be – that's a little bit of a loose stat. I'm sure maybe he's referring to a quarterback as on the roster that started a game because I, I don't know that the, the kid who played against us, against Memphis, it was their starter all year. I don't even know who the hell is playing for Temple these days. Um I can't, yeah, there's got to be some – maybe Oresco needs to – yeah, maybe there's an asterisk next to that thing on that paper. He, didn't read. <laughs> he was supposed to say asterisk, uh, and he just forgot to. <laughs> yeah, who, who the heck knows? He probably – with all the papers he had there in front of him, who knows if he was even reading that stuff correctly. <laughs> right? That is fair. That so, is fair. Uh, all right. Well, that's that's a lot of comings and goings, happenings around, uh, around the program. But we're going to take a quick pause after that uh, with fall camp – starting uh, on monday we're gonna go through some some big storylines that mike and i are keeping an eye on and uh get your temperature on those too so everybody sit tight don't go anywhere we're presented by gordon and partners where the sun's used yet this is ucf head football coach gus miles on and you should listen to the sons of ucf like your hair is on fire go knights and charge on Camp is starting, Mike. Get your tents ready, get your stoves, get everything you need for, for a good camping experience because football camp begins Monday, August 1 for UCF as we count down to uh, to kickoff in uh, in September. 
uh, where we welcome in South Carolina State to FBC Mortgage Stadium, Mike. But in these next 30 days or so, a lot will be happening. Obviously, the team will form. I'm sure there's a lot already figured out. And there's probably still much to be decided. So here's a, a, a top five. It's not in order, so this isn't our traditional top five. But here are just five storylines that, that I think we're monitoring um, uh, with, with this camp opening up. And I'm going to leave quarterback out of it. That's the obvious one. We already know that. We know that's a thing. We've talked about that a ton, Mike. So here are five kind of maybe maybe under the radar, just maybe storylines to keep an eye on. Mike, you tell me if you agree with these storylines or your take or if we missed any of them as we go here. So here's the first one. Let's keep an eye on the UCF's offensive line. They played pretty well last year in spurts. Obviously, introducing a new system, uh, usually a, a, basically a new quarterback throughout the entire season. That they played well. If you, you look at some stats, they were uh, they were number four in in the power um, formation success rate. Uh, they were number sixty five though in pass down sack rate, which is pretty mid mid road of the country there. So I think there are times they played really well, and there were times that they they played not so well and they looked pedestrian. Losing two guys off that line in uh, in Cole Schneider and, and uh, Marcus Tatum. Uh, with potential for replacements and Ryan Sobrota and uh, and Tylen Gable, both of those guys transfers in. Mike, the, the UCS offense will only go as far as that offensive line takes them. Again, I think they were good last year, um, but I think there were times where they were were a little bit um, a little bit weak in certain areas. So, can they take that next step in year two under under Coach Herb Hand, who everybody says is a fantastic O line coach, and I have no reason to doubt that. A lot of returning um, veterans on that. Sam Jackson has been here. I think he graduated w- with you and I, Mike, in, in 1998 at this point. Um, so they've got a lot of veterans on that line. But the offense will only go as far as the O-line takes them. So I think that's a storyline to monitor is this O-line, how it comes together, who gets the starts, and how quickly they can gel and become one cohesive unit. This is what football has been about for 100 years. It, everybody loves to talk about quarterback play and receivers and running backs, but – it all starts with the offensive line for every team. And it seems like we're going to be in a pretty good position with the guys we got coming in this year. You know, Sam Jackson now, you mentioned it. He's been a captain of this team. He's been a leader for a while. To have him come back and kind of keep that continuity going on the line, I think that's a big deal. Um, Matt Lee now is a veteran on this line. He's been, he's been really good for a while. So I, I expect him to even be better now as, as an older guy on this team. Paoli, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. I've avoided saying his name for the last few years. But he, <laughs> he, he's what, on the Outland Trophy watch list? He, he, he is on a list, yeah. He, so is Matt Lee, I think. Yeah, so those guys in the middle, that, that's a big deal having them come back. And then the transfers, I think we're going to be fine. There was, what was it, like two or three years ago, I think we were coming in saying this is the best offensive line we've ever had ever. And they turned out to have a bad season that year. Yeah, um, it was the 2020 so, year. And even last year, I think we thought we'd be okay. We returned everybody on that line. I think we thought we would be just, you know, a dominating, you know, you know, Dallas Cowboys, like 1995 style offensive line. And while it was good, I think there were times where we were like, Ugh, you know, the line, the line got beat on that one. And we missed an assignment here, missed a block here. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think this, this group has potential, just like you're saying. Yeah, well, it's different, right? With the mouse on offense, it's different than the hypo offense. When you're getting rid of the ball in, in under two seconds, you don't have to block for that long. But now Malzahn, as we see, more of a power running game. Did you see that video of Malzahn breaking down just that one play? What was it, the buck sweep or yeah, something like that? Yeah, good old buck sweep. And how many different things are going into this play, all involving the offensive line. All right, you got to pull this guard this way, and he's kicking out this way, and this other guard's coming around here, and he picks up the safety. And then you got the, the tight end chipping over. It's like 40 things going on. When we watch it in real time, what are we seeing? Uh, Bowser has the ball in his hands. Oh, he just hit this guy. Okay, he got four more yards. That's all I really noticed. <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing where the offensive line are going. Even sitting up at the top of the cabana, you know, it comes out a couple times a game. I'll remind myself. Let's kind of focus in on this guy on the line, see what he does. But then after that, it's just back to watching the ball. Yeah. But it, this thing is more complex than we give it credit for it. And I think it helps having these guys come back now with another year, have it, and give some of them credit. Sam Jackson's played under three different coaches now, right? Three different systems. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it can't be easy coming and, and learning all these different new schemes and things like that. But now that we're in year two of Gus, I think it's going to help. 
and, and I'm, I'm excited about the transfers too. Those guys are some big dudes. Well, this is another. This is the unit that probably needs that quarterback decision made as quickly as anybody does, right? Because blocking and I think scheming for John Rice Plumley is probably going to be a little different than blocking and scheming for Mikey Keene, right? So I feel like this group up front specifically needs to kind of know who who's going to be back there and what kind of style of offense they're running. Because I suspect and this is just my layman's thinking, right? J- JRP and Mikey have two different skill sets. They probably excel at different items. I assume Gus will tailor his his system or the play calling for that particular game to whatever guy's in there. I imagine these five guys up front need to know as quickly as possible who's behind us because that may impact a lot of what it is that they're asked to do and how they're asked to perform, you know, within each week in the game plan. That's right. And having a running quarterback can help the perception of these guys greatly too. How many times did we hear from offensive linemen that we've interviewed? Uh, yeah, we didn't give up any sacks, but a lot of that was because Mackenzie Milton would just find his way out and, and make it a positive play. It's not that they were so good that they blocked everybody. So that makes a big difference, too, for how we're going to look at this offensive line. If we're seeing Plumley get out there and, and run for 35 yards, maybe it was a busted play. Maybe the offensive line didn't do their job. He just turned it into a good play, and then you don't think about it. Whereas if, if it's Keen or somebody else that can't get away and can't make that play, then all of a sudden, oh, man, the offensive line sucks. They just gave up their third sack today. What's going on with those guys? So that, that makes a big difference, too, I think. And um, I wonder if they have a preference. They're never going to come out and tell you. God, no. But if I'm an offensive line, then I'm probably like, give me the guy that makes me look better. And I don't give up any sex because he can't, he got away and made a nice play. Yeah, you would ass- under that guy, as you would assume that's Plumley, right? Because who can maybe make something right. out of nothing, right? At least elude a tackle and run out of bounds for two yards, right? Versus getting getting walloped for a loss of 10. But I, I think these guys want to know as quickly as possible. I don't, I don't know if we'll from a fan base standpoint, be able to know how this is coming together, right? I don't know that open scrimmages are available to, to the, the student body at large. I, I think um, there may be some shareholder society folks maybe get to see some of these. So I don't know that we'll know how the O-line is really playing out. But I think this group coming together in this fall camp, figuring out who, who, who the quarterback is, who are these five guys are going to be in, in position, I think is going to be crucial. Mike, here's my second uh, thing to watch for uh, as fall camp kicks off. Who is going to be able to get – consistent pressure on the quarterback and I'm talking non blitz Mike obviously we want to run blitz packages that's fine but who is going to be able to get home and get to the quarterback are we going to have that those one or two guys that are going to be able to really wreak havoc in the backfield and and screw up the the other team's offensive rhythm here's a here's a staff for you eight guys last year had more than one sack for UCF three of those guys Cam Good Tatum Bethune and Big Cat Bryant are all gone we still return Traymond Morris Brash, Josh Salascar, uh, who had four and three sacks, respectively, Mike. But pressure on the quarterback, particularly with, with your front four without having to send the house, if you can get home with, with your base four up front, you have a ton of advantage against the other team, Mike. Can we find somebody? Will we be able to get pressure on the quarterback you know, consistently with our, with our front four um, without having to call blitzes all the time? And if so, who's going to be that person? I think that's an important storyline to, to look for as we go into this fall camp. Yeah, I always love big guys up front on defense getting it done. Now, I mean, go back to my Giants when they won their Super Bowl the last couple. That's what it was. It was Strahan and and even Yura and those guys up front getting after the quarterback. And how much does that help the secondary and the linebackers do their job? So I, I believe we have the guys that can do it. Mm-hmm. And I, and listening to Gus the other day doing an interview, he was he brought up too Ricky Barber yep. up the middle. Yep. If you can get pressure up the middle, and he was hurt for a lot of last year, but if he's healthy and he can do what he's, what he's capable of, that makes a big difference. Quarterbacks are used to having guys come off the edge, and, and you can see that in the corner of their eyes. When a guy comes up the middle, like Warren Sapp used to do, right up the middle and just disrupt the play right away, that'd be great. But I, I am excited about the outside guys too. Selaskar, we've seen it for a while now. Yep. He made a big impact from the very first day up in Georgia Tech that a couple years ago. He's now a veteran on this team, a big guy on the outside. Him and Traymond Morris Rash, if, if they can do it along with Barber, I really like to see this defensive line do what they can do this year. Key is got to stay healthy. We saw it last year. Kalia Davis gets injured, yeah. uh, and it changes a lot of things. So we can stay healthy. Those core guys, and, and I like the depth that we have. I think we can be in for a very good defensive line season. Yeah, th- those middle three, right? So you, you mentioned, obviously, um, Ricky Barber. Lee Hunter, obviously a, a, a transfer from uh, um, Auburn, 6'4", 320 pounds, him coming in. And don't forget Keenan Hester, Mike, played really well last year when he got some time in the field. That's 6'4", 305 kid. If those three up the middle can get any bit of push up the middle, that would be fantastic. But to me, it's the guys on the outside. You mentioned Tramon Morris-Brash. 
we've seen flashes again. You know, if you take away everybody, the returners, he led the team in sacks last year. We learned recently, though, from uh, I think it was Brett Bell that we, we did not know about um, that, that he's asthmatic. So perhaps that's an issue. We'll see how that works out. But I think he's a guy I'd love to see break out. Stelliscar plays really well in, in moments and spots. I think, can he keep it together consistently? Um, you know, will he make that push at, now his junior year? Um, you know, I think that's a big one. I'm also keeping an eye on this Katie McDaniel, um, the, the transfer from Kentucky. 6'2", 250. You know, I think everyone expects he'll play that big cat Bryant role. Um, you know, he's listed as a D end, even though uh, technically I think he was a linebacker at, um, at Kentucky. So that probably tells you where UCF thinks he's going to be. You know, if he can, can make some havoc as kind of a new guy coming in, um, I, I think that could be big as well. To your point, I think we have the bodies. Can they stay healthy? A is, is probably the, the biggest question. Then B, you know, can, can we just, you know, find ways to schematically get them available, get them, you know, get them to make some noise. I, I think if we can get pressure on the quarterback and, and with our front four without having to bring blitzes all the time, this defense will just be lights out. Yes. And the, the group that's going to benefit most from that has got to be the linebackers. Yeah. Cause as we know, and we've discussed many times, we don't have, we don't know the depth that we have there. So if the guys up front are getting it done, you can keep those guys back a little bit and, and not have to depend on them to blitz so much. I think that's going to help a lot. So, uh, it, it all starts up front, offensive line and defensive line. For as much and as little as we actually pay attention to it during the game, that is the biggest part of football. It always has been, always will be. Third storyline, the return game, special teams return game. We've talked about this a ton over the years. Uh, last year, Titus was essentially our uh, our punt returner. Obviously, he's now transferred out at back at UCLA now. So he, he's obviously not qualified to be returning punts for UCF at this point. So who's going to return punts? A. B, kick returns. Largely was handled by Johnny Richardson last year. Um, Ryan O'Keefe stepped in a little bit as well, Mike. So, A, who are our returners next year, this upcoming season? And B, can we get any success off of that? I think uh, Ryan O'Keefe, we know, has a ton of speed. Yeah, he makes a lot of sense. We've seen Amari Johnson back there on punt returns. He seems to be kind of be in and out. I think he had a big fumble last year, and, and ever since that, I don't think we saw him back there returning kicks. So, you know, can that get cleaned up? Can he kind of figure that out? Is there somebody coming in new that, that we're not aware of? Can a Kobe Perry return kicks, right? Are there are there the guys on the roster that we don't know about? But the return game is one that we, we've even long been saying, man, we, we missed the times where that was a, a, a third phase, a weapon of the game that we could leverage. We just haven't had that in a long while. So, A, who are the returners? And, B, can we finally make some noise and, and have a couple of nice breakoff runs that uh, can set us up offensively? Yeah, it's been a long time now. I mean, and we were spoiled for so long with all the guys we've had. Great returners. Uh, do we have one on this roster? I'm not sure. Uh, and I, I, you know, Johnny Richardson did a, a pretty good job. But how, do you really want your, one of your top receivers? You want O'Keefe right there returning kicks all the yeah, time? Yeah, yep. Typically, not really. You know, I, I, I know I don't. So if, if a guy like Amari Johnson can step it up and do it, that'd be great. Um, maybe it's a kid we haven't seen. Maybe it's one of these transfers that we, we don't know much about yet. Uh, but we, we need something. We, we, we got to turn that into a positive. It's been a negative. It killed us in the Navy game last year, special teams. We got to start flipping special teams around to being a positive, as it was for so long for us. Uh, it, it, it changes the game. It when you, when you, if you just win special teams, or if you could make a, a game-changing play on special teams, it changes everything. So uh, I don't know who it's going to be. Uh, who would you pick me right now? If you had a – a punt returner right now for the game. It's fourth quarter, two minutes left. They have us pinned deep. We need somebody to get us in, into positive territory. Who do you want to return a kick or a punt? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I like Omari, Omari Johnson's um, – j- th- he's not he's fearless, right? He, he, you can tell he wants the ball. He wants to make a play. He just hasn't really been as sure-handed, I think, as we would have loved him to see. But I, I like his, his competitiveness. He seems fearless with the ball in his hands. You know, he's going to make a move. He's going to, you know, get some contact. He's not afraid from that perspective. Obviously, you, you know, you know, O'Keefe's got the speed, right? So if you're telling me that I just need a straight speedster, I mean, O'Keefe would make a ton of sense. But to your point, I don't want to leverage O'Keefe out there with an injury, and all of a sudden now I lose my top, uh, my top wide receiver. Those are probably the first two names that come to mind. Um, R.J. Harvey, I mean, he's got some speed. He's he's a he's a smaller back. Um, you know, does he have the ability maybe to return some kicks from that standpoint? That's I I don't know. That's the I have no idea who outside of who we've seen. And it could be those two guys, but again, to your point, are any of these guys who came in, you know, Javon Baker, you know, Kobe Hudson, uh, you know, Kobe Perry, are any of these guys uh, eligible or, or able from a punt return, kick return standpoint? You know, how about Jordan McDonald? He's 6'1", 220. You know, get him a ball to kick off and just run some people over, right? I mean, I think, <laughs> think you got some options. I'm just curious where, where you know, Blackman and, and Gus want to go from that standpoint. It's going to be 
an interesting battle and maybe something that doesn't get talked about much. Who's the starting kick returner? Yeah. But I, I figure he's going to mix it up for the first few games until he finds somebody that he's comfortable with. Somebody that So that's really the first couple of games is look at an audition. Who, who wants to be that guy? Who can be that guy? Because a lot of it, too, is mental. I mean, and a lot of it is not trying to make a play when it's not there because that's when you get the turnovers. You, know, you try to do too much sometimes. I, I'd rather a guy be safe with it, but at the same time, we need one of these home runs at some point. We need a big play to change the game. Here's uh, number four, Mike. I don't know how important this is because it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. I just think it's an interesting storyline. What's the running back rotation and split of carries going to be? We have so many guys in that running back room. It's really a good problem to have. But how are we going to leverage all these guys, A, in the, in the era of transfer portal, right? But B, you know, in the spirit of keeping Bowser healthy, you know, keeping keeping these guys healthy. Uh, we know Mark Anthony was injured a bunch last year. We know Bowser was injured a bunch last year. What's the rotation going to look like? Who's going to get carries? Uh, you know, how, how are we going to spell Bowser? How many how many carries is Bowser going to get? We heard Gus say, "Hey, if we need to get him, you know, a bunch of carries, we'll get him a bunch of carries. If we can be smart with him, we'll be smart with him." Well, what does that mean? Who who's getting carries? Again, from from that standpoint, um, and and how does that rotation look? I mean, you, again, Bowser Richardson, Mark Anthony Richards, and R.J. Harvey. That's my top four rotation right now, Mike. I have no idea if that's right. I don't know how you do a four-man rotation and running back. Um, if Plumlee's running as well as a running quarterback, that's probably taking some runs away too. I'm really curious what this running back rotation looks like. Again, I think it's a good problem to have, but I'm curious how Gus is going to set all this up with all the talent we have back there in the backfield. Yeah, typically you don't get more than three guys getting consistent carries. If everybody stays healthy, you know, you – you get your bell cow running back with Bowser. He's going to be getting the majority of the carries. We know that in big games. Gus is not afraid to feed him. I mean, look at the Boise game last year and the Florida game at the end of the year. You know, he'll give him the ball 35 times. And if he's going, that's fine. But uh, you're going to have to have at least one other guy to get in the mix. And it's right now, Johnny Richardson is the leader in the clubhouse. Sometimes you can get a third guy, at, but they're not going to get more than 10 carries a game. They're not going to maybe get more than six carries a game, yeah. you know? And a lot of that may come in, in garbage time, too. So I think right now, if you have to draw it up, you stick with what you ended last year with, with Bowser and Richardson. They're a nice complement to each other, different style running back. Um, I'd love to see what this McDonald kid can do. Now, I know he's just a freshman. Yeah. But we've seen freshmen come in. And if there's a position you can come in as a freshman and, and contribute right away, I think it is running back because it's such a reactionary just – instincts i know the play is drawn up and you're supposed to follow the tackle this and that but so much of it is just knowing when to cut or, or seeing something that's open and going and, and just the, the size that he has the power that he has i think he could be successful right away uh but it, we're we're very lucky to have the, the yes. amount of guys where right now i would say if we're going into a game and bowser can't play you know do we feel horrible going into a game with richardson and and you know um mark anthony richards or or uh, R.J. Harvey, I, I think we'll feel okay for a game or two, depending on who the opponent is. Obviously, we don't want to miss Bowser for a Cincinnati game or something like that, but I think we're okay with, with the amount of guys we have and uh, the offensive line that we talked about earlier. If they're doing their job, it, it's going to make these guys look good anyway. Well, hey, I'm curious if Bowser's going to be in a pitch count. I think that'll be interesting. But if you think about it this way, Mike, I, I think of it too, is there's power and speed. Uh, I mean, not that the, you know, the power guys don't have speed, but Bowser goes 6'1", 225. Um, Jordan McDonald goes 6'1", 220, and then Mark Anthony goes 6'1", 215, right? Those are your bigger backs. I feel like maybe th th there's two ways to cut this up. The bigger back rotation is, you know, maybe it's Bowser, Mark Anthony, maybe it's Jordan McDonald. Kind of the, the smaller scat back, speed back type of guy, right? You got Johnny at 5'7", 170. You got R.J. Harvey at 5'8", 195. And don't forget about this DeMarcus Bowman kid. We're not sure if he's eligible. He's the, the five-star transfer, I think, from Clemson. He's 5'10", 193, right? So, Maybe I, I think it's split up more that way. Like, okay, I, I, this is a third down. I need a big back. Bowser's down. Hey, let's get let's get Mark Anthony in there. Or hey, let's get Jordan McDonald in there. Hey, it's second and, and nine. You know, we need a bit of a screen pass. Hey, let's get let's get Jay Rich in there. Hey, let's get RJ in there. Right. I think I'm wondering if if Gus will break it down more by 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 size and by, by skill set if that makes any sense versus by just a pure all right RB one's down bring an RB two I I think there's probably some interchangeability based on the down and distance and based on what he wants to do with the play call all right and the guy you didn't mention Xavier Townsend who was supposed to be like an Otis Anderson can play a little running back yep. and receiver and plus how many times have we seen and even in the uh, game against the Gators Ryan uh, a run play with yeah. 
Ryan O'Keefe, or a, a right receiver coming over, and now you're adding in Plumlee also running. Um, it, it's going to be a lot of different ways to run the football, and it doesn't have to just be with these guys. But I, I think it does – I think he does like to having that combination too. So let's say if, if Richardson was the guy to get hurt, just because, you know, Mark Anthony Richards is the next guy up, doesn't necessarily he's the next guy in because he'd be the yes. guy to replace Bowser, not necessarily Richardson. Yeah. So, yeah, I could see it working out that way too. It's all going to depend on game situation. You know, if we're in the fourth quarter and we're just trying to wear down the clock, you know, we don't need somebody to bust a 60, a 30 yard or 40 yard. We just need three yards at a time, four yards at a time, keep the clock going, four minute offense, bring in the big guys, somebody that's going to hold on to the ball. That's it. So I think that's going to have a lot to do with it too. By the way, the same could probably be said of the wide receiver room as well. I think you have the, the same issue uh, on, on that side as well with uh, both Kobe Hudson, Javon Baker, uh, Ryan O'Keefe, and you have Mari Johnson, right? Then you have Jordan Johnson. I think you have an embarrassment of riches there. So that rotation will be interesting as well. But here's my number five, my fifth and final um, item to, to keep an eye on a storyline as we head into fall camp, Mike. Who is going to be the playmaker on defense in sort of that middle half of the field? Right, so I'm talking middle linebacker ba- back through the safety area. I think we're we're really well covered on the outside, right? Everybody knows uh, Devontae Brown you know, proved to be a shutdown corner last year. Corey Thornton is playing well in spots. You know, we saw Brandon Adams get in there, cornerback. He played really well. You know, Jane Francois there. We, we know about Justin Hodges and that sort of that that hybrid role. I feel like on the outside, we have some pretty decent talent, some, some guys who can hold their own. It's that middle of the field losing um, losing Tatum Bethune, obviously. Who's going to kind of roam that middle of the field? You think about the best UCF is UCF defenses of kind of all time, right? There's always been that middle linebacker or that safety that's back there that's always made plays. It was Richie Grant, if it was Nate Evans, right? If it was Shaquem Griffin, was he when he was here? There's always that guy in the in that sort of back middle part of the field that was kind of that that playmaker. Who was that this year? Is is it Quadric Bullard who played really well? I think he got hurt down the stretch, seventy two tackles on the year. Is it Devod Wilson who seems to be kind of moving around a little bit? At least what you heard in spring camp. You know, can can JJB Jeremiah John Baptiste step into that role and sort of patrol that middle? You know, is, does a transfer guy like Kobe Perry come in? Does an Akai Martinez get some run early uh, as a true freshman in play? But you think about the best defenses UCF has ever had. We typically have somebody kind of patrol in that middle part of the field, either in the secondary or in the, in the linebacker spot, making plays. Mike, I don't know who that is this year. It could be a lot of guys. I just don't know who that one guy is. I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> and the defense, yeah, remember Terrence Plummer was yeah, an animal yep. all around the middle of the field. Somebody like that. Um, I don't know who it is either. And because a lot of times you think automatically to linebackers. Now we've got a couple transfer linebackers that were very highly rated coming in at a high school. Let's see if they can do something. Uh, Gene Baptiste has been here for a while now. He's he can be a he seems like more of a quiet leader, right? Wasn't yep. he supposed to be on uh, what's it called the media days? And I, he I was, saw, yeah, last yeah, yeah, last second O'Keefe came in. He was actually supposed to be on the live show once too. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> so uh, maybe he's more of a silent leader kind of guy. Uh, a guy like Devon Wilson seems to be the vocal leader, mm-hmm. at least according to the Hour Time Show last week. I mean, a lot last season. Um, so that's going to be an interesting thing to watch for sure. Because as we noted, the defensive line seems like they're ready. The question mark has been the linebackers, but you throw the safeties into the mix too, just to the middle of the field. Uh, give me Devon Wilson to be that guy. To be maybe just because I mean I see him more in interviews. I don't know, but yeah. I'm just gonna. Or you just you hear his name called during the game, man, and mm-hmm. he he's always around the ball. So. Give me him as that guy this year. Yeah, and it's not. I'm not saying we don't have the the, the talent. I just don't know who that. Who, someone's going to have to step into that role because I think it's kind of unknown right now. I mean, again, you have Terrence Lewis, the, the linebacker from uh, transfer from uh, Maryland, who we have not seen on the field yet. Is, is he going to be that guy? We have Jason Johnson, the linebacker who transferred in from uh, from a D2 school. We have Walter Yates, the third, six one two nineteen. I mean, he's he's coming in new. Um, you got Cam Moore, uh, Bam Moore's brother. Again, he's a true freshman. Is is he an option back there? Uh, we already mentioned the Kai Martinez. Um, you know, you, you've got you've got some names. That, you know, as, as Gus would say, there's some guys. Dylan Lester will be back there at some point in time potentially. Uh, it's just who's going to step in and sort of be the that playmaker on that back end. And it doesn't even have to be leading in interceptions, leading in tackles. It's really just kind of organizing the defense, getting guys in the right order, and you know, really being a force over the middle of the field, either on the shallow stuff from a linebacker standpoint or in the back end as a safety. Again, I think we got the corners and the edges pretty well shored up um, on DB side. And I think, to your point, the D line is pretty stout. It's just that middle part of the field. That's That's the part that concerns me. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's see what these guys are up to this year. I, I don't know, man. This is a question I don't know. I don't even think Gus is ready to answer this question because I don't think he knows yet either. So let's see what T-Will can, can draw up. And if, if he can create pressure, with some, be creative in some other ways to get pressure, maybe these guys' job gets a little easier and they're able to control the field a little bit better in the middle. Best part about this entire exercise is as I was preparing for this, I recognize we have a true freshman linebacker by the name of Stone Boss. That's a cool name. Yeah. Stone He's Boss. 511 205 from Lake Mary. Stone Boss. I feel like this kid needs to be good. With a name like Stone Boss, you better be freaking good, no? It sounds like he should be a fullback or something. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I, mean, I hope he's a good kid, by the way. Seems like a really nice kid. I don't know him at all. Um, but Stone Boss, I mean, when you when, you're, when your parents name you that, like there's expectations. It isn't like they named him like, you know, you know Pete Frankowitz. Like, Stone Boss, like there's <laughs> there's expectations, my friend. <laughs> well, I mean, the last name is what it was. It's just the first name. They could, I don't think they would have changed his last name to Stankowitz. But um, <laughs> Boss, I remember there was a Kevin Boss who played for the Giants. Yeah, not the same as Stone. No. Stone, Stone is a... Uh, it's yeah. a strong name. If your name is Alex Boss, okay, cool, good luck, right? If your name is, you know, Frederick Boss, yeah, cool. When your name is Stone Boss, I mean, we're expecting big things out of you, kid. Yeah, uh, like I said, I, I, I picture a fullback. I picture like a bowling ball type guy, a, a short, stout stone that just barrels people over with the name like Stone Boss. I also forgot Brandon Jennings, a linebacker transfer from Maryland via Kansas State, uh, 6'3", 226. He's a, uh, I guess he's got four years of eligibility left. He may be another guy in the middle. I'm like, all right, am I missing any storylines? Anything that, that I'm missing that you're keeping an eye on as well? Do you have an OLI here for the five things to monitor through fall camp? Well, we didn't say kicking game because I think a lot of people have asked about the kicking game, right? Yep. And, yep. I mean, it's Obarski's job to lose right now, right? I think we all agree on that. You would think, uh, right? You you would think. Even the punting game. We brought in this, this Australian kid, Mitch McCarthy. Uh, six five to fourteen. I know. Osteen was on some award list, but I mean, you, you've got some interesting competitions. I think in the kicking game this this fall camp. I mean, I'm giving Obarski the job for now, but very. I mean, it's an open competition in my eyes too. Obarski, I believe, only hit one field goal last year from forty yards, and was exactly forty yards. Everything else past forty, he did not hit. So we got to start correcting that. Uh, I think the best play he had all season was that fake field goal, right? But he got out of bounds at the very last second against Navy and then kicked the field goal anyway. Um, I, I, I am not 100% sold on Obarski, but for now, until I see somebody come in and take his job, and that Colton Booner, Boomer uh, video that I saw today, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that kick was good. So <laughs> I wasn't happy with seeing that. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the kicking game is, but let's see if somebody can come in and, and the camp and just dominate. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of kicking is mental. So just come in with that confidence and attitude. You know who had a lot of swagger and confidence? I always got was uh, Sean Moffitt. Every time he came out to the field and he kicked one, he was just cool about it. They mm-hmm. had their little cool high five celebration and stuff after that. Um, Matt Wright, for as good as he was, still just a bit of a nerd, and uh, I love oh, that geez. he's been on the show and stuff. But he, he just looks like a nerd, right? <laughs> Moffitt was more of a cool looking dude. Not that it has anything to do with the ball. It has nothing to do with that. It's just, <laughs> no, it's just yeah, well, talking about swagger and confidence. I like to see my guy go out there. And it looks like when he goes, leaves the sideline, he's going out there. And I look at his face and I say, that's a guy that thinks he's making this kick. I think he's making this kick. Yeah. Sometimes when Obarcy has gone out there and we see, you see the look on his face. It's like, I don't think he's making it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure he's not making it. Yeah. So that, that's a big part of it, at, at least for a fan. anyway. I will say this. Um, in, in, in Obarski's, not defense, but whatever, but obviously he, he had a, an up-and-down sophomore year, right? And so we, we bring in this kid, Riker Casey. Everyone loved this kid because he had like a million touchbacks on kickoffs in his one year at App State. And we thought, all right, this is the guy that's going to unseat um, Obarski. And Riker Casey didn't see the field last year. Obarski handled all the kicking duties, right? This year, we get Colts and Boomers coming, and he's going to be the guy to unseat you know, uh, Obarski. So he's, Obarski has been through this before and he keeps winning these battles. So I got to assume that he, you know, he's got some, some moxie about him too, but uh, that's a good one. By the way, a kick return option. I forgot, Mike, maybe Quan Lee. Oh, okay. And as we've seen, Gus is not scared to put a freshman back there. He put Titus back there last year. So yeah. if Quan Lee's got the hands, we, we've seen some video. It looks like he's got the speed to do it. So uh, that, that's interesting. Quan Lee. And he's going to be wearing number 99. That's why I didn't see him because I was looking up at the, at the early numbers. Like that's where my kick returners are. I didn't think they were down at 99. And I was like, oh, crap, there's Quan Lee. That's why I was nervous. So I saw the list of jersey numbers. Yeah. It seems like there's like 200 guys on the roster because almost every number is used twice. Yes. Offense and defense. 
I, and then I noticed there's only four guys with numbers in the 60s. So maybe that's why there's so many duplicates of other numbers, which is kind of weird. With all the offensive and defensive linemen, usually all the 60s and 70s should be used up, right? But yeah. only four guys with the numbers in the 60s. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And there's also uh, two guys with uh, defensive end numbers in the 80s. Um, Giannis Thompson uh, is number 84. Selskar is number 88. I always find that weird, too. Yeah, that is a little weird, too. But I think that... I mean, college football has always been funky like that. I think the NFL kind of loosened it up a little bit last season, right? Where it's, you see a little bit more of that. Yeah. But uh, I, re- I kind of remember, like, uh, the, speaking of those early hurricane years, they seemed to always have some guy on the defensive line that had some, like, number in the 80s, which was weird. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm remembering that. Oh, you're, I think you're probably right on that. Always pay attention to who gets the the, uh, the small number, too. The the zero, the ones, all those things. That usually tells you something. Uh, Jakari that, Henderson got number yes. three. And if you saw that, Mike, and Damari got that's number a, eight, got right. number eight. So, I mean, they, they got the smaller numbers as, as true freshmen. Uh, keep an eye on that. I don't know. Xavier Townsend also got three as well. Yeah, I, I did notice that too. It, it kind of reminded me of that video in the offseason. I think it might have been the, the video of UCF and, and Florida. You know, who was that guy that does the video and he does the, the coaches break? Like, uh, uh, film? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he, he goes, oh, so you, I finessed myself into a small number here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's coach 30. It, it, it is a big game. deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal to get, especially as a freshman. You usually have to wait out those numbers. But I guess with so many numbers being used twice, nowadays, it's not that big of a deal. As long as one's on offense, one's on defense, you could have, I think we have two number 10s. We have two number ones, two numbers. Do we have two zeros? Yeah, we have two zeros. Yeah. I mean, well, almost uh, everything is. Marco done. Delmio is listed as zero, but he's also in the transfer portal. So I don't, I, I think he's technically still on the roster. Maybe he's coming back. I don't know, but he's still listed on the roster, although he, he announced his uh, intention to be in the portal. So he's the defensive zero, uh, where Jay, uh, Johnny Richardson is the offensive zero. And only one number one, uh, Javon Baker on offense. Right. But, you know, like we were saying, freshman, you have to sometimes wait out. Or you keep, yeah. yeah. Johnny Richardson was 26 or something, right? And- 25. 25. Yeah, and you see guys do that all the time, change numbers. Uh, Otis, oh, sorry, Otis is what I was thinking. Otis yeah. was like 26, yep. and then he switched to number two. Traquan Smith get was number numbers. 80, I think, for a long time. Then he got the he got the number four for a while, right? I think that, that happens all yeah. the time. So. Yeah. so maybe these freshmen have come in and shown that they can earn one of these lower numbers, and they're given that. So, uh, something to watch, I guess. Yeah, it's, it up. probably means absolutely nothing, and these guys won't play at all. No. But who, <laughs> who knows? Any other storylines? Like anything else we're missing here before we we take our next break? Anything else that you're keeping an eye on that UCF Mike's like? I'm watching this, and uh, I want you to know I'm watching this. Uh, are we talking about like beer uh, hot dogs at the topic of Do you want to talk about that? You, you want to monitor? <laughs> I, I, all right, then, well, let's get into that because the controversy talk. came up this week. Uh, I think it was the sidelines UCF account posted that uh, a rumor that had been circulating that. No more mixed drinks would be available. Um, it would be uh, the Cutwater brand, which comes in a can, which is kind of like a pre-mixed drink. There was a bit of a fervor, a bit of an uproar uh, on social media. Timo actually responded back and just said something to the effect of, our fans are going to be really, really happy. And rumors are coming back that maybe they're going to walk that back. I don't think we've still gotten a full scale of will a uh, full stadium uh, alcohol sales be available. But then Mike, Mike threw himself off the top rope to Timo directly I think your exact quote was hot dogs in the cabana or GTFO. So you, you, you've clearly put your line in the sand and where you are. And you don't care about the cut water. You don't care about the mixed drinks. Just give Mike some goddamn hot dogs. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm very upfront about it on the show. I am a selfish person. I want what, I, what it matters to me. And to me, I'd love to have a hot dog on the top of the cabana. <laughs> but those, that, that whole announcement did throw me off even for just a minute being unselfish because I am a guy that will just drink beer during the game. And this new rule would probably make the beer lines faster if they're just handing mixed cans to, to people. But unselfishly, the people that I do go to the games with, they only drink the, the regular liquor. Mm-hmm. You know, my buddy that I've had season tickets with now for since the season before the stadium opened, going back to the Citrus Bowl, uh, he doesn't drink beer at all. He drinks, he, he likes his Tito's, he likes his vodka. Mm-hmm. Mix. Well, actually, we went to a bowl game when we were playing Marshall in the bowl game. Me and him, I went, we went over to the Funky Buddha here in Fort Lauderdale which I may be at in about an hour or so. Um, we went there to go watch the bowl game, and they only sell beer and wine there. And we had to leave because, you know, the guy wasn't going to have a good time. He, wasn't gonna, he wanted a couple of drinks, so we had to walk down the street to somewhere else. And there's people like that. My wife, same way. She likes certain kind of wine. If not, she wants her vodka. If it was just to save time and, and maybe, I guess, save a few bucks, I think they were going to make the wrong decision getting rid of that. I'm glad 
that maybe that that's not going to happen and, and there will be liquor for those people because i want everybody to have a good time I, yeah. and that's maybe going back to being a little selfish because if i'm at the game with people that are not having fun they're going to drag me down mm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. with my yeah. wife and she's all cranky because she can't get a drink that she likes mm. then she's in the pissy mood then I, i'm in a little bit of a pissy mood so go. let's make everybody happy here unselfishly for me and kind of selfishly at the same time uh i'm glad <laughs> that, that they're not going to get rid of liquor if that's the case but also get them some hot dogs Yes, yeah, and give me some hot dogs. At the top of the cabana, if, if I need to be very clear about it. Because actually, for years, and probably up until last year, last year was the first year you joined me in the cabana, right? Yes. With season tickets? Yes. Yeah. So all all the other years before that, I was always a stay-in-my-seat guy. Mm. I always sat in my seat. I liked sitting in my seat. I never really, especially that lower cabana, where they didn't have the top cabana for a while. That just started a couple years ago. But that lower cabana, you'd have to get there early, and people would be, to me, I didn't see the appeal of just like bumping elbows with guys I didn't know all the time. And you get a little bit closer of you, but whatever. And you get to stand, I guess. I was always a stay in my seat guy. But then you moved in last year. You found a spot up there at the top. It's a nice breeze up there. That top it is, is nice. so much better. I don't, maybe I shouldn't be telling people this because <laughs> then you're going to see more people up there crowded around. But it's so much cooler up there. It's not as packed. You're not really elbow to elbow with everybody you kind of got your own space we can jump up and down it was cool for us when we brought the kids they had a little room to like run around because they don't even really care about the game um so i just want some hot dogs up there so i don't have to go all the way back down okay and and get my hot dog and and plus in the main concourse in cabana you can't see the field if you're in the beer line or you're in the hot dog line you can't see i know they have tvs but it's something different about just being able to look over my shoulder see the game myself hand the lady two bucks, get my hot dog and walk right back to my spot. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. That is a dirty little secret because there, there's a beer cart like, like 10 paces from us. So you, you uh-huh. literally like leave that little elbow area that we're, we're leaning against. You walk 10 paces, come back with like three Miller lights. I mean, that, it's, you're literally gone yeah. for like two minutes, not even, not even max. Any to your point, if you hear a thing, you turn around, you, you look at the field, you see the big play and you turn back around, you get your Miller light and move on. All you need are hot dogs. Apparently. That's right. Yeah, because I think there was a couple times we were up there. I remember a game with my kids too. They were hungry. Yes, that is fair. Like, well, that go is go fair. get get a go get a couple hot dogs right over there. I'm like, what do you mean? There's no hot dogs there. They only had peanuts and chips. Yes. I was like, oh crap! So now I gotta go downstairs. Yeah, that's I fair. Gotta, yeah, walk all the. No, if it's right there, just like the beer. Oh my god! I don't think I'd ever sit in my seat. <laughs> yeah. I'd probably t- just be up there all day. Well, Terry Mahadra, you now know how to get rid of UCF Mike's seats. <laughs> just have him. You'll stand all day if you get some hot dog and some beer, and I guess some some mixed drinks in case he's got a friend with him. Yeah, Easy enough. exactly. So, you know, make everybody happy is, is the solution here. And all there's I, a way to do it. All I know is this has got me really excited about I can't wait to get back to a game because uh, bringing back all these memories, all this fun, is, uh, is certainly got me uh, uh, very anxious to get back to the stadium soon, hopefully uh, soon enough, Mike. But let's take a break uh, here. Uh, that was word, that word was break, by the way. Uh, and uh, we'll come back with Cow of the Week. Uh, brought to you by Gordon Partners. Don't go anywhere. This is UCF Athletic Director Terry Mahajra, and in my spare time, when I'm not on TikTok, I'm listening to Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Go Knights and charge on. All right, cow of the week time, Mike. Obviously, we uh, uh, pay homage to our friends uh, on the Tampa side of life and uh, make fun of something that somebody has done that we think is funny, stupid, idiotic, whatever. Uh, and, and sometimes, Mike, the cows end up being the cows. It just works out that way. Why would it not? And you're going to go first, and I think this week, uh, true to form, the cows have once again become the cows. Yeah, I I say this every time. When the cows are the cows, it makes it so much easier just to do this segment. Um, They don't disappoint. Again, this week, it was uh, AAC Media Day. And, you know, uh, to show you how far the AAC has come now, we're just doing this thing online. We're not even (laughs) going. All the other conferences are back. I know everybody during COVID did this. But now this year, everybody was back in certain spots. The SEC had their media days. All the all the coaches were there, all the players. Uh, American Conference still saving a couple bucks, doing it online, which requires, you know, I guess, internet connection and a, a camera. I, I, we do this setup every week for our live show. Yeah. Not that hard. Are you saying we right? could have hosted uh, media day? Sure. We should right? have hosted media day. That would have been fantastic. That would have been fantastic. We kind of do host a form of media day every Thursday. <laughs> when we right. have guys on for – from all over the conference and we have guests and yeah, we do about the similar things. So we figured it out. You know, the conference seems to have figured it out. The cows <laughs> maybe not have figured it out. I don't know what they're doing. So they have their two players being interviewed at the same time, which was that weird because I saw our guys get in, uh, interviewed individually. 
were they just running out of time by the time? I think the Cows were the last team. Maybe they just wanted to wrap things up, interview both guys at the same time. It's possible, yeah, because a lot of guys did get one-on-ones. Uh, but there are some schools that – I don't know if the school got to pick. I don't, I don't know. But, yeah, the, the Cows were also last, and it was it was getting long in the day. Yeah, I didn't watch – to be honest, I did not watch any of the other schools, so I don't know if – You're in luck, Mike. Go to our YouTube channel. Things. We've posted a lot of those there. Go to YouTube. All right. Okay, so then we'll check those out. So, anyway, they're interviewing both guys at the same time. <laughs> And there's a picture that comes out that shows both of them with headphones, but one set of headphones for the two of them. So they have the cord, which, by the way, still cords? <laughs> Who still has cordless, I mean, corded head- headphones? I don't know. This is 2022. Even I got cordless. I got the AirPods about two years ago once we got into 2020. So the cows are a little behind there. And they have these guys sharing the headphones. It just looked funny. If you see the picture, I was cracking. And they both looked miserable at the time. Too. <laughs> like, what, what are we even doing here? Uh, so their cow of the week for one, I guess, not splurging for a couple of air, a set of AirPods, and then it would have looked, looked fine. You know, you see these guys kind of like leaning towards each other because they can't get too far away from each other because the cord <laughs> is only so long. Uh, but if they if they had some AirPods, you know, I probably would not even notice that they each only had one in and they were sharing. But this was just too obvious not to point out this week for cow of the week. So the cows, once again, cow of the week. Maybe since this is the last season, I might find a way to make the cows cows of the week every week from here on out. It won't be hard, I imagine. No. <laughs> yeah, it'd probably be, it'd be, yeah, it'd be probably be easier, mostly. actually, than what you would normally do. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, literally one, one guy had one uh, in his ear, the other guy had one in his ear, and they had to sit close to each other. And if one guy, like, moved, like, the other guy, it literally, like, they were, they were like, connected by a chain. If one guy went, the other guy had to go with him uh, in, in true cow fashion. I'm like, I'm going to stay uh, for the AAC Media Days for my cows of the week. I have multiple. Uh, a, uh, we talked about it earlier, Mike Oresco. Unbelievable. You mentioned this earlier, uh, just a second ago, frankly. Um, media day, typically, you know, you get the commissioner up there. He, he or she is given a speech. You know, there's a teleprompter maybe they're reading off of, or, you know, they have some prepared notes maybe in front of them that they're just kind of referring to. We saw Brett Yormark do that. Uh, we saw a bunch of commissioners do that. You know, a, a nice presentation, a nice professional setup, right? Not Mike Oresco. He literally had like 40 pieces of paper that he held in front of his face. And literally read word for word from it wasn't like they were notes like talking points and you know key key uh, highlights he wanted to hit he literally read word for word from these pages holding him up blocking his face half the time you know going on and on about certain topics no teleprompter anywhere nearby uh so uh, old school mike Oresco, you thought using corded headphones was bad dude i think wrote these out by hand it was just reading them to the public like that was the way our 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 valuable commissioner uh, gave his speech this year rah 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 I'm going to read some papers. Yeah, talking about splurge for headphones. Splurge for a teleprompter. Right? How much can that possibly be? I think every, you go to your local high school, every single one of them will be able to let you borrow one for, for an hour or two. And <laughs> Resco just looks silly with his glasses halfway down his nose, <laughs> looking up, you know, whistling his S's like always. Um, I, to be honest, I didn't watch his, his speech at all. <laughs> I saw the pictures of him also on our holding YouTube the papers. Page. I maybe saw a, a video of maybe a quote, you know, a 30 second spot. I did not watch. What was it? 40 minutes. He was talking for. Yes. He went on. Uh, on. No, I, I probably, as much as I love our YouTube page, <laughs> I want to support it. I don't think I can handle 40 minutes of Oresco, yeah, you know, droning yeah, on and fair. reading notes and, and bashing us, by the way. I was, that was my next part. Way. Yes. I was mad. Well, Hey, I was, the, the other thing I would say is I would recommend holding up cue cards, but he, that thing was like four. I mean, you'd, you'd have needed like a 2000 cue cards uh, if you were holding up cue cards for him to read off of. So I guess papers work, but he did bash us at some point when sort of the, the question of the topic about losing talent or losing teams came up. He, he basically said, well, I mean, Tul- you know, Tulsa's beaten UCF a bunch of the last couple of years, right? So Oresco uh, took his, uh, took his parting shot uh, at UCF on the way out. Yeah. He, he's a jerk. Well, you know, we haven't got along with him and we told him to his face in 2017, like, hello, where are you? Can you get our back here? He didn't really do it. And then he, he kind of started doing it for Cincinnati, which kind of pissed people off even more last year. And now he's got a couple jabs on the way out. You know, we're, we're, we know who's going to get the last laugh here. It's going to be us once we move to the Big 12. And he's going to be stuck promoting FAU next year. You know, the big showdown between the cows and the owls. Uh, you know, I'm sure he can't wait. I'm sure that the networks are really lining up to see. The Willie Taggart Bowl, baby. Like that <laughs> so I mean, we're going to have the last laugh. Ultimately, we were all a little scared that this guy might get the job in the Big 12. Imagine that. Oh. What a difference already. You see the difference of your mark, a guy that's been a commissioner for about two weeks now and is bold and goes out there and says things already. You know, about, you know, he's not backing down to the Pac-12. 
You know, this guy came out already, and he's already talking about stealing their teams. Whereas Oresco was so scared to say anything. Oh, UCF deserves to be. He never said anything to back us up back then. What a difference in commissioners from a guy that just took the job to a guy that's been holding on to this conference with tape for the last eight years. Well, you, you took my next cow of the week, Mike. I, I'm, I'm going to go to the Pac-12. Their, their commissioner, George, I think it's Kalivikov is how you say his name. Uh, they had their media day, and uh, he essentially was, was asked or talked a lot about the Big 12. And at one point was basically like, we've got to defend our conference from you know the, the infighting, and we've got to defend our conference against uh, the Big 12. We're under siege. They're, we're under attack. They're, they're essentially coming after our teams, and you know, we've got we've to you know, clamp down on the enemy there, right? Not one time that he actually mentioned the Big Ten, who actually stole his teams. His entire focus was on, on on the Big Twelve and how they've reached out to people and you know how they're not playing nice and not playing fair. Not one time he's like, oh, and by the way, the Big Ten actually is the one who took my conference and like threw it up and spit it out. Right? He came after the the, the Big Twelve all he wanted to, but conveniently left out the fact that the Big Ten is actually the one who caused all of this mess in the first place. Well, don't forget, he has to stay loyal to the Alliance. He's in the Alliance with the Big Ten and the ACC. Mm. You can't say anything bad about mm. those guys, right? That's Big Twelve's not in the Alliance. That's so fair. I guess that's okay. his thinking. I, I, I saw that. I laughed at it. Uh, he, that looks like a guy that is scared for his job and scared for his conference existence. May not be around in, in the next couple of years. Um, you know, it, there was talk of a merger for a little while with the Big 12, Pac-12, but when you do that, you know, who is the commissioner then? You can't have two commissioners. He may be out of a job either way. Um, he looks scared right now. Let's see. Maybe he's got something up his sleeve. Is he, he going to come back and steal a couple of uh, Big 12 teams? That does not seem that likely, right? It, it does doesn't, not. You haven't heard chatter of all of a Kansas going to the back. Well, they can take you know. Kansas if well, they want. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, no, I, mean, I think if they expand, they're going to want to uh, try to grab like San Diego State potentially. Uh, maybe a Boise State. I don't. I don't think they want anybody in the Big Twelve at this point. I think they're going to want to grab other schools and try to basically fortify and say we're going to stay together. That that would be my guess. But they can have Kansas if they want Kansas. I I think they'd go after BYU first. I mean, hmm. That would be a that would be a big move actually because BYU is a big cog that's joining this conference. But I feel like if I've always heard that stole them. that BYU won't work there because a lot of the the Pac-12 commit uh, presidents like Stanford and Cal they. They, the religious stuff and they don't play games on Sundays. I feel like I've always heard there's a philosophical difference and that's why BYU was never in the Pac-12. Then maybe they're changing their mind when money's involved, but who knows? Yeah, well, yeah, that may be true. That may have been the case at all times, but when it, it, uh, if you're a school like Cal and right now your options are, well, hey, you guys got to give in. Stanford, you got to give in. You got to get BYU in here to keep this conference alive. Otherwise, you guys are heading to the, the Mountain West because <laughs> – Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, they may be going to the Pac-12. What are you guys going to do? I mean, to the Big 12. What are you guys going to do? You guys are going to be left over. The conference is going to be dead. So you may have to put those differences aside. And if it means getting BYU in here and then the, the Pac surviving, if we add BYU and, a, and, I don't know, a Boise or San Diego, then maybe they're talking a little bit. But I, it, it's not looking good for the Pac-12 right now. It's not looking good for a, for, for a lot of reasons for that group. But, but luckily, he's solely focused on, on the Big 12 and is forgetting the fact that uh, the Big Ten just literally robbed two teams from uh, right under his <laughs> nose. And we'll let him figure all that out, Mike. But, uh, again, camp is here, Mike. Finally, oh, my goodness, we've been talking about nonsense for months and months and months. It was finally good to talk some real football. We'll get some 10-minute videos. Uh, hopefully soon I would make sure you're keeping an eye on Trace Trelko's uh, uh, Twitter feed, at SignPez. She'll have a bunch of stuff posted up there, too. We'll try to put some stuff out uh, all week as well as camp gets kicked off. I think Thursday is media day, so – uh, some more sound bites from uh, from some of the players, and we'll see what we can what we can glean at that point, Mike. But it's finally good to get this thing kicked off. It's been a long time. It feels like it's been forever since we played football again. It feels like it's been forever since that Gasparilla Bowl. Oh man, I tell me about it. I don't know how we made it through another <laughs> off season. <laughs> Barely, we limped. We limped through season. this one. Man, yeah. Last year, I mean, there was so much going on with uh, you know Hypo leaving and hiring Malzahn and Danny White leaving and bringing Mohajer. It seemed like that offseason flew by. This offseason is just dragged, and we're tomorrow's August 1st. This yeah. is it. Camp is opening. I'm excited now again. I think I'm going to get rejuvenated here in this next month. All right. Um, Happy Mike has uh, returned. Give Mike some hot dogs. He'll be ecstatic at this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, and this right now, everybody else too, you got four weeks now. Get in shape. You know, I always joke around. By Labor Day, going into Labor Day, I am in the best shape I've been in all all year, because the next four or five months after that is just going to be a lot of beer and hot dogs and mm-hmm. 
staying up late watching games. Yeah. It, it, it turns into a mess. I, you know what I am? I'm the living depiction of that that picture of Tiger Woods and John Daly. Okay. That's UCF Mike in the off season. <laughs> and UCF Mike when football season kicks off. That's me. Um, so right. get in shape now. We got another month now, and, and I'm going to still be doing the shows, but I'm going to be training now, and then. Come September 1st, first game of the year, which, I mean, can we announce this yet? Are we going to do this? The pregame game show? What are you going to announce? September 1st, oh, Thursday, yeah, first sure. game of the year. Oh, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, why not? Well, uh, if, well, hold on. If, if, if you're going to do it, I mean, you, you're, the bigger, you're the bigger obstacle here. If you're going to be able to be wherever that's at, then we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to be home. Trace is going to be at the game. We've been doing live shows every Thursday. The first game of the year is on a Thursday. I've been asked by the guys here at the uh, Alumni Association locally. I went to a bunch of their watch parties last year, got to know them. They're ready to set me up first game of the year. We do a pregame show. I do it live from the location. You do it live from your home studio. We'll check in with Trace. We'll, we'll still do an hour show. I know a lot of people that usually listen to us are going to be at the game. But you, know, you can still watch us. If you're hanging out at Burger U or you're walking towards the stadium or you're sitting in the stadium, if you can get cell phone reception, uh, you can watch the pregame show there. And we'll be there, and you guys can interact with us then. But I'm, I'm going to do it. He told me not to reveal the location. I know where it's going to be. I can't tell you yet. <laughs> uh, we'll be hyping it up for the next month or so. I'll I'll do a live show from the thing. And if you're at the event, you know, maybe I'll have you on. Maybe I can interview, hey. interview a couple guests. Hey, we hey, can, hey. We can do some different things. Hey, hey. Wow. Well, so, yeah, that'll be fun. I can't wait. Yeah, no, another item that I can reveal, Mike, is um, thanks to our friends at Gordon and Partners, we have got uh, a bunch of show swag that has uh, has ended up. You may or may not have seen me wearing one of these uh, during the live show this past Thursday, Mike. We got a we got a bunch of shirts. A bunch of swag came in. Some sun stuff out there uh, that we will find ways to to put to good use to to get in the hands of everybody out there to to get on the backs of everybody out there as well. So maybe I'll get those. Maybe I'll, I'll ship some down to you, Mike, so you have some to maybe hand out while you're at that party there uh, on uh, on opening day. So. Also look out for that. A bunch of uh, Suns swag has uh, has matriculated in here. Yeah, I, I saw them. I saw you wearing it. They look very cool. Um, I told you to send me a few. So when we do this uh, pregame show, I'll have a yeah. few. Maybe they hand out there at the event. Uh, we'll be at the Louisville game. We'll hand out a few there. And we'll, just, we'll have them all year. And I think we have at least like 100 of those, right? I, believe so I didn't count them all. It seems like a lot. Did not count them. Seems like at Definitely. least 100. Yep. Mm-hmm. More than the uh, hats. I mean, hats have been limited here. We're getting hats maybe yeah. a dozen at a time. Yeah. But this is a kind of a bulk Sons of UCF merch we haven't seen in the past. Yeah. I, I like it. A lot of people, there's a lot of people that want some Sons of UCF stuff too. It's odd. It's some, odd. The lucky ones have gotten the hat. But a lot of people want, and we haven't been able, just because we don't have it. Yeah. And, you know, we're not selling these things. We're just doing it out of our own pocket. We're lazy. But Hoffman and, and the guys at Gordon and Partners, they stepped up with these shirts. They look beautiful. I want to see people all over the cabana wearing these shirts when I'm not there for the game. So um, <laughs> keep your eye out and keep your ear open to where you can find one. Eyes, ears open. Also keep all of your social media stuff following at Sons of UCF, wherever you do that. YouTube channel, Mike, I think we're up to like 530 subs, which is fantastic. Keep telling friends, keep subscribing. We'll throw some more content on there. That That's also at Sons of UCF. And then Thursday night live show, 8 p.m. Myself, Mike, and Troy Strelko will be back talking all things fall camp. We'll have some special guests, I assume. We'll talk about what's going on around the team. We'll get you all ramped up here as fall camp is over. Mike, it's been too long. We're excited to get started here. I can't wait for the uh, next month to uh, hopefully fly by. Before you know it, we'll be all together again in cabanas and, and parking lots and wherever it is that we go watch parties, wherever it is that we go uh, watching UCF football. But until then, everybody have a fantastic week. Enjoy the week. Take care of each other. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Everybody go Knights. Charge on.